Hi there, it's Sarah Murray, host of the A. Gilman podcast. I wanted to hop on quickly to provide an extra special introduction to this very special episode. In honor of a late Senator, John S. McCain's birthday, which passed on August 29th, we wanted to have a military-focused episode. Today on the A. Gilman podcast, we are having not just one, but two guests tell us about their time abroad. Our first guest is a scholar who applied as a veteran of the U.S. Army and was awarded the Gilman Scholarship. The Gilman Scholarship has a focus on supporting undergraduate students of limited financial means who are receiving a Pell Grant to study or intern abroad. Preference is given to veteran applicants when other factors are equivalent. Our second guest is a recipient of the Gilman McCain Scholarship. This new scholarship under the Gilman program is for students enrolled at accredited U.S. colleges and universities who receive any type of federal financial aid. Students who apply for Gilman McCain must be undergraduate dependents of active duty military members. These interviews were done separately in order to highlight the stories of two different military connected individuals experience going abroad with Gilman. Lastly, since I have you here, I want to thank all of our listeners for the positive responses we have received since debuting our first episode. If you have loved listening to the podcast as much as we have loved producing it, please give us five stars and leave a review so we can continue to grow our audience and reach more people just like you. Okay, now back to our regularly scheduled programming. Gilman Scholars, this is your captain speaking. Get ready for takeoff. Hello and welcome to the special episode of the A. Gilman Podcast, a podcast produced for the Benjamin A. Gilman Scholarship team. My name, of course, is Sarah Murray, and today I'm going to sit down and chat with an inspirational triple threat, who is a U.S. veteran, mother, and a student. Welcome Gilman Scholarship recipient, Lindsay Clark. Oh, thank you. I'm flattered. It's a very (laughs) beautiful description. (laughs) (laughs) Well, it's true. It's you. Um, And (laughs) thanks. I've had a chance to sort of get to know and learn about you over the past few weeks, but could you tell listeners a little bit about yourself? Sure. Uh, I'm a medical student. I am a second year medical student at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai in New York City. And um, I'm probably just about the furthest thing from a traditional medical student, as you can probably imagine. I took a very circuitous route to get to where I am. I was raised an army brat you know, moving around a lot every couple of years, uh, moving around the country and the world. Um, And I went to college for a couple of years, actually, as an English major. I was always like a lover of the humanities. I dropped out, enlisted in the army, and then um, I went back to school in Maryland, got a degree in biology, took a year working in a lab. And while I was there, I popped out a baby three months before starting medical school. Uh, (laughs) Yeah, so it's been... um, it's been quite a journey, and I know we're going to talk about it a little bit more, but that's the skinny, basically. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I know it's been a while since you studied literature, but did you have a favorite author back in school? Oh, I had a lot. So um, I am a huge Toni Morrison fan. She's mm. probably my favorite novelist. I love American literature in particular, and I would be remiss if I didn't mention um, Moby Dick, which was probably <laughs> like still one of my favorite books. Um, it had a really big impression on me like back in the day um, and definitely still informs my love of the ocean and love of marine life, um, which was part of my Gilman experience. Yeah, and it's a classic as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Fantastic. <laughs> I haven't read it myself, but definitely have had more reason to do so now. And like you already mm-hmm. mentioned, you were an army brat. You grew up in a military family. And then like you already mentioned, you enlisted in the U.S. Army um, where you did everything from what, like being an Arabic linguist to jumping out of airplanes. Like, what did you not do? Um, <laughs> a lot of stuff. <laughs> yeah, it is. And it's amazing. <laughs> but if you could narrow it down to a few, what were some of your fondest memories or proudest accomplishments during your five years that you were enlisted? Yeah. So you actually probably mentioned the two um, aspects of the army that were like the most fun. I think Mm -hmm. Um, learning Arabic in Monterey, California was absolutely fabulous. It was so fun. You know, you go from knowing nothing to, you know, being quite proficient um, by the end of it. So that was like a 
60, I think 62 week program or something like that. Um, and then probably the other most fun thing was um, jump school, like learning how to jump out of airplanes. Um, that was three weeks long and so fun. And I continued jumping when I went to um, my unit, the 82nd Airborne. Um, but jump school itself was just like, yeah, it was so much fun. <laughs> Wait, I'm sorry. It was only three weeks and then they just push you out of a plane? Yeah, yeah. It's actually, you know, it's two weeks of training and the third week is jump week. So it's really two weeks of training. <laughs> And then they push you oh, out of Oh, gosh. <laughs> yeah, but I guess sort of bringing it all back to studying abroad in some capacity, how did being a part of a military family drive your interest in studying abroad? Sure. So like I mentioned in my um, intro, being part of a military family, um, just for some context in case people don't know, um, you do a lot of moving. And it really depends on like um, your parents' job or uh, like what branch of service they're in. But for my family, um, we we did do a lot of moving and we did a lot of like international stuff. So we lived in Belgium when I was very young and um, we lived in South Korea three separate times. So that was sort of like the closest thing I had to a uh, home. Yeah, um, that's where I ended up um, graduating from high school. And we also lived in Heidelberg, Germany. Uh, and, you know, to this day, I'm 30 years old now and I have not ever lived anywhere more than three years of my life. So moving around and traveling has always been a part of my life. Um, so, you know, my experience, I, I can only speak for myself as far as like what inspired me about living abroad as a military family. Um, I will say that it is probably um, not what people tend to imagine when they think about living abroad. It's sort of like a weird, unique subculture almost. So, you know, you've got um, you've got these posts oftentimes in like some prominent location. Um, and, you know, just like buildings, these sort of like drab brick Cold War buildings, <laughs> that's what everything's made out of. And, uh, you know, there's like, there's sort of like one of everything. So there's like one elementary school and one middle school and one high school. Um, and it's very much like melting pot if you think about like who joins the military. Um, super diverse, um, it's, it's, a weird sort of utopia in a way. But the, but I guess the, the cultural immersion aspect of getting to know right. the culture outside of those concrete walls was challenging in a certain sense. If yeah. everything you need was within those walls, yep. getting to explore the neighboring culture that you were currently inhabiting was probably way yeah, more limiting. It's, yeah, it's not, so I will, I, it's not limiting so much, but, you know, to your, to your point, if you didn't want to, you could like pretty much never leave post like everything you need is there um you like there's some certainly nothing like compelling you to explore uh if you really didn't want to um and that's i think like pretty different from as you're saying like an immersive experience uh, but like i said like the the beauty of it is there's it's like a very melting pot vibe and um yeah, that's pretty neat to have like kind of a, yeah. I guess like a mini U.S. in a sense because of the diversity of America is then brought over to wherever your base was. Yeah, and it's it's not that like it's untouched by the country that you're living in. Um, like very much that influence is felt like at my school, for example, in my high school in Korea, um, I think somewhere around 70 percent of our um, of our students were Korean or Korean American or um, I didn't know any Korean. of this. Yeah, there's also like a community of people that attend the school, like outside of military families sometimes. And you previously described yourself as a non traditional student um, when you were applying for the scholarship specifically. And then how much of that non traditional student status that you've given yourself is sort of tied into the fact that you're a veteran? Probably. A lot of it, not all of it, because um, there were other things that made me non-traditional, um, just by virtue of being older, um, you know, being married, um, eventually having a, a daughter. Um, so there was there was more to it than that. But I so when I did Gilman, mm -hmm. that was in 2017. Um, so I was married, but I didn't have my daughter. Um, and I will say that, like, I definitely, um, I definitely like leaned into my veteran status quite a bit when I was applying and um, 
you know, when I was thinking about my, um, Mm -hmm. my service project and everything. Um, But I think anytime you sort of, um, anytime you like are trying to speak to an identity that's important to you, you, it's kind of hard to have to strike this balance between, you know, um, talking about why it's important to you, but trying not to make it like that's all that you are <laughs> and that because you have a lot you know there's a lot more that you can offer besides that and yeah. it's only one part of who you are and you kind of already touched upon this a little bit when it came to your um your gilman application specifically but what components of different aspects that you feel make made yourself a non-traditional student became an asset when you were applying to the gilman scholarship or how were you able to be successful in your academic and cultural immersion abroad because of your non-traditional student perspective? I think it was absolutely like invaluable, um, not just to the to the application process. I think it definitely helped me when I was applying, but also just from like a more what I see as like a more um, in a sort of more genuine way um, in that it, it really just it it helped me thrive (laughs) and it helped me enjoy myself um yeah being a non-traditional student being an older student uh is super important to my being successful there's no way i i could have i i would have ended up in medical school if i had like continued on um the path that i was on when i was younger so it was the only way that i was going to get to where i got um and as far as like as far as you know thinking about gilman specifically having leadership experience and teamwork experience is always excellent but there are a lot of places where you can where you can get that i think um the military experience like it's sort of like the stakes are higher you know what i mean um oftentimes and you know there's there are certain um there are certain aspects of jumping where if you do something dumb you risk the life and safety of the other people on the aircraft so there's a lot of you know, um, there's a lot of like foundational trust that goes into that sort of teamwork um, that I think is is a real asset when you're doing anything, but especially something like traveling abroad where you might be working with a small group of people, um, where you might, you know, need to, to um, bond with a small group of people, at least in a functional way, um, and recognize that like the team is bigger than yourself. Um, I also think just, um, adaptability and this goes back to you know the way i grew up as well um not just all the moving around but also being in you know different foreign places um and yeah learning to learning to adapt and adapt quickly and these are sort of like soft skills so they're not they're less about like a you know they're not very quantifiable you know i would encourage everybody to not undervalue these things you know but i i encourage people to you know, think broadly about whatever your, um, whatever your Gilman experience is going to be. There's a lot of things that are relevant (laughs) and, and you can, you can gain valuable, valuable skills, you know, if you want to call them that, um, soft skills, uh, doing things that you're passionate about that are not necessarily exactly you know, something that's tailored to be a bullet point, a quantifiable bullet point on your CV. For my Gilman um, experience, I went to Madagascar. And um, so we were, you know, doing marine conservation research there. And then I ended up in medical school. So, you know, that on the surface of things, that's not like a relevant experience. Um, But I gained so much from it. Filling out the resume has its own importance, but so is finding your own path. And I think studying abroad can give you the avenue to find that there are so many alternative paths for you and there's so many more interests for you, not only that you can bring back to the U.S., but so many opportunities for you abroad. Um, and you mentioned that you were able to go abroad in Madagascar, and I, I know that you probably have dozens of memories. But if you could tell me or walk me through one of your favorites, I'd love to hear about one of your favorite uh, moments being in Madagascar. Thinking about, like, um dive wise and ocean wise, I think probably my favorite memory was, um, so I was conducting and I was conducting a uh, marine survey. And what we did was like, we would um, zigzag back and forth across a a given area. And we would 
um, look for these things called indicator species, which tell you about the health of the reef. So um, some of them, you, you see a lot of them. Others are very rare. One of the ones that's like pretty rare to see is a big red octopus. Um, not only because there aren't that many of them, but also because, you know, they're great at hiding. <laughs> that's kind of their thing. Um, so, you know, I was like zigzagging back and forth and like sort of on the end of one of my zigzags and I like sort of grabbed onto a rock and, you know, it was, my body was sort of swayed to the side and I just sort of peeked in to this little crevice and saw an octopus. And like, as soon as it saw me, it like changed color. Um, yeah, so that was like magical. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. And we know that you are recently a new mother. Yeah. Congratulations. Um, but, <laughs> um, but what do you hope the future of international education study abroad will look like for your daughter? How do you hope it will maybe change? How do you hope that it stays the same? I have to say that the first thing I hope is that it still exists, like it's still an available because, you know, when you think about the future of anything, um, I think you have to think about, you know, some of these really big picture things that are happening right now, um, especially uh, climate change. And you know, thinking about the impacts of climate change on interna international travel, mm. the carbon footprint that we leave anytime we visit a place. I guess I would hope that the opportunity to travel internationally still exists in the first hand, um, hopefully in some sort of more sustainable, transformed <laughs> form. Um, and if it does exist, I would hope that it would be more equitable. I think that I would hope, you know, for Inara mm -hmm. specifically, that's my daughter, by the way, <laughs> um, that she, you know, if she, if these opportunities are available to her, that she doesn't take them for granted, that she recognizes what an enormous privilege it is. Um, that's a great idea. And also just that it's like very grounded in respect. Um, but of course it's, mm -hmm. you know, it's a, it's a two way street. Um, anytime you go somewhere, yeah, you leave you leave an impact. Yes. And as as Gilman continues to exist, I know that we plan on continuing to make study abroad more accessible as well as really helping our students recognize that it most definitely is a two-way street. Um, in that you are there to not only grow yourself, but you're also there to give back and educate yourself on the diverse communities that inhabit our globe. And I know that you have traveled everywhere, but if you had any dream travel destinations or international experiences remaining uh, on, your, on your bucket list, so to speak, where would you like to go? What experience would you like to have? I, I like to ask um, all of our guests this to conclude our episodes. Yeah, um, that's a really fun question and a really hard one to answer. Um, I think one place that I would really love to go is um, Rwanda. I would really love to study and learn from um, their uh, healthcare model that they have there. Any highlights specifically of, of what they've done that you want to study? Yeah, um, their um, outcomes for maternal health um, and women's health and obstetrics. Um, that's a that's a you know personal passion and interest of mine, and um, hopefully that could. Um, inform my own practice and my own advocacy um, here. Well, I do sincerely hope that you're able to take that trip to Rwanda sometime in the near future. Is there a way for our listeners to get in contact with you after this episode airs? Uh, sure. Yeah, you can check out my Instagram. But yeah, yeah, follow me on Instagram. <laughs> Well, unfortunately, Lindsay, that's all the time that we have for today. I couldn't be more thankful to have had you share your stories and adventures abroad with myself as well as with all of our listeners. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much. And we're back. It is now my absolute pleasure to introduce our next guest, Angel Torres, who is a part of the inaugural class of Gilman McCain Scholarship Recipients. Thanks for taking time away from homework to chat with us on how. Uh, hello, Sarah, and hello to our fellow listeners. Um, thank you guys for having me. Of course. 
So besides being a student at the University of Puerto Rico, what else would you like our audience to know about you? Well, Sarah, uh, I would like them to know that I am a senior year chemical engineering student in the University of Puerto Rico. Currently, I'm doing research in agricultural sciences. I'm doing an auto sustainable aquaponic system. It's a personal project. And Very cool. I look for, a, yeah, yeah, it's pretty cool. It's about sustainability. And I got the idea after Hurricane Maria that they stayed in Puerto Rico. And as I've already mentioned, you were a part of the inaugural class of Gilman McCain recipients this past year. Angel, what's different about the values in regards to international education, studying abroad, that someone may learn specifically growing up in a military family? Well, I learned from a very young age that my dad traveled a lot and got to learn a lot of different cultures and traditions. So it motivated me to keep moving forward and to do like a study abroad experience. And it motivated to go take the step, like not many students take that first step to, because it's a pretty long process and it's not that simple. So it's pretty nice growing up in that environment. It really motivated me. And what did receiving the Gilman McCain scholarship mean for you? Wow. It was an honor, really. It made it possible for me to take that step because I was uncertain to go to my exchange program. The Gilman McCain scholarship gave me the opportunity to to keep uh, going for my dream. And then what values have you learned or gained from being a child of a military service member? Like maybe um, like if there's any soft skills that you felt actually really helped you when you went abroad or in the application process? I've learned a lot of values. Uh, I would say punctuality is one of the strongest ones. And I would say responsibility, like take responsibility for your actions and every option that you take has a has an end result like an effect and punctuality you take into account the other person's time and you respect it so that's like i take that into account and deadlines and those soft skills definitely do matter and then i know unfortunately during your brief time abroad um you talked to us well talked to myself previously about your experience with culture shock could you tell us a bit more about that initial feeling of isolation, how you sort of overcame that cultural shock and built your own community abroad? It was pretty intense the first time, like the first, I would say, week. Once you get used to it, once you get to learn uh, to meet new people and meet new exchange students that are studying abroad and they're going through the same thing as you and It really changed my perspective because I thought I would be friends with people who were from my from my background, like Puerto Ricans or Dominicans. But the ones that were really my friends or my colleagues that were close to me were from other countries like Central or Southern America. That's great to hear. And that definitely helped you, you would say, overcome that initial feeling of isolation, just the culture shock that comes from studying abroad anywhere but for you especially studying abroad in Europe because you, you studied abroad in Spain. Yeah, I, yes. Thank you for stating that. Yes, I studied in Spain. Yes. <laughs> it was really shocking to go to another continent and like knowing nobody and the people around you, surrounding you weren't really uh, going for conversations with you. If it, like you wouldn't go to the street and talk to someone because they're not, they weren't really open to talking. Sure. I can imagine how that was challenging. And unfortunately, your time in Europe was cut short due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Can you tell us a bit more yeah. about what the process was like? Um, how did Yelman help you in any capacity to return home? Give us some insight on that experience. Well, I think it was in the early weeks of March that we started to hear about the COVID-19 uh, pandemic in Spain. And from one day to another, it got really hectic. It got really, the lockdowns, complete lockdowns, you couldn't go out. You, there were military members outside 
of like they were in wow the town plazas and the streets and you couldn't go nowhere unless you were going to the pharmacy or the supermarket that there's no other option like you could not go any other place you had to stay in your in your apartment or room whatever you were i decided to come to puerto rico because the situation was really getting out of hand like i at, like i would like to thank the gilman the gilman mccain scholarship for being very attentive with me they were with me all the time they were asking me what flight number i was if i got to puerto rico uh okay and even before the pandemic they were very attentive they from the first second they were emailing me and asking me was i was okay Thank you for sharing. And I, I'm grateful, honestly, to hear that you were able, that Gilman specifically was able to help you return home safely. And I'm grateful to hear that Gilman was not only helpful to you before you went abroad, but also during what I can only imagine as you described was a very hectic and stressful time period. And you were one of hundreds of students that the Gilman program was able to return home safely and soundly. And so I'm happy to hear directly from a positive experience from someone who was able to go through that. Um, but regardless, so sorry that you had to have your study abroad experience cut short. And I know many students' plans were turned upside down when their international educational experiences were cut short. Some students were there for a matter of hours. Some students had been there for three weeks, two months. But when we actually spoke earlier, you mentioned that there were some upsides for you. So could you tell us about what it's been like adjusting being back at home so soon and you know how the end of studying abroad for you actually came with some surprising advantages? Yeah, so Sarah, uh, I've been taking online courses. I took a course in the summer uh, in my bachelor's degree, which was a pretty uh, difficult class. So I've been trying to take off my uh, take like the thought out of my mind by doing diverse activities. I've worked in a, a part-time job. I've also worked in personal projects. Well, I'm happy to hear that you were able to take advantage of that time and initiate with some like online virtual programming and also just do like a little bit of self-care there. So that's really great to hear. Um, but that's actually all the time that we have for today. But before I formally let you go, I did want to ask, could you tell me about a dream travel destination or international experience that you'd like to have in the future? I would like to go to Australia and snorkel in the Grand Barrier Reef and go to the Outback. Oh, and the Great Barrier yeah. Reef? Yeah, and uh, see the Outbacks. Very cool. Are you, do you happen to be, like, are you scuba cer certified? Yeah, I have the, yeah, I have scuba certification. I oh got it, like, when I was, like, 13, yeah. Wow, so you're basically a, pr a professional. Okay, then. No, no, I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't say that. I just uh, do it amateurly. Sometimes. Well, that's still, that's still very cool, and Australia is a far adventure for one. I don't doubt that's very much worth it, but Thank you so much for having time to chat with us today. Is there a way for our listeners to get in contact with you after this episode airs? Uh, yes, they can contact me at LinkedIn, which I, I, uh, it's copied to the video, and my Instagram. Perfect. Thank you so much for your time, Angel. It's been a pleasure. Okay. Thank you, Sarah. And thanks to the listeners and uh, Gilman McCain for giving me the, the opportunity. One last special thank you to our two guests, Lindsay Clark and Angel Torres, for joining us on this episode. And please don't forget to like and subscribe to our podcast where you may listen to us. And stay tuned for our next episode, launching October 1st. Thanks. Till next time.